Welcome back to the final part of tonight's Late Late Show. It is time now to talk to a crime journalist whose fearless work has made her an authority on Ireland's drug lords. She is the host of the hit podcast Crime World and her new book, Cocaine Cowboys, is out. Now, would you please welcome Nicola Talent. <laughs> Welcome to the well. show. How are you doing? Thank you very much. I'm doing well. And yourself? I am good. I You're am settling good. In. Uh, settling in. All good. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about last month, biggest uh, drugs bust in the history of the state. Yes. Uh, looking from the outside in, that kind of feels like it's progress. It looks amazing, doesn't it? Yes. Is it? Two tons. It is. Look, it's absolutely something to celebrate to have got that much. Um, the drugs were coming from a cartel called the Clan del Golfo. They ship 20 tonnes a month. We got two. Okay. So that gives you a kind of an idea of what is coming into Europe. And basically, there was an intelligent-led operation there, but they were also unlucky. There was a little bit of bad weather, a little bit of bad shipping, and some of the drugs came in on the, you know, on the waves. Same so, thing so happened in Donegal, actually, mm -hmm. over the summer. So what you're saying is, is that these big shipments uh, are coming in, some of them are being caught, but there's just way more coming in. And that's why this book here, Cocaine Cowboys, which is made, uh, it's a map of Ireland made up of cocaine, mm. um, <laughs> which basically suggests there's that There's a reason for that. <laughs> well, it suggests that it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, how widespread? Look, I mean, there's report after report coming out, um, the UN, Europol, we are doing really well in it, Ireland. We're always up there in the top three as users, unfortunately. Um, and it's in every small town in this country. It's in every pub. I mean, I speak to people who use it. I speak to people who deal it, who ship it. I speak to people working in addiction counselling. They're talking about people coming in in their 60s who've never used drugs and are coming in with addiction problems with cocaine because they found it in their local pub, in the toilets, it's for sale, it's everywhere. It's like a blizzard and it's coated this country. So when people talk about Ireland, they talk about drugs, your brain goes to the Kinnahans. Mm. Um, are they as powerful as they used to be? They're not, but I suppose the Kinnahans in a way is a story of Ireland because while we're prolific users of the drugs, we've, of the drug, we've also kind of punched above our weight on the international stage by the Kinnahans because if they were a football team, we would be celebrating, we would be welcoming them home in an open top bus. They're not, they were street dealers who became billionaires um, during the golden era of cocaine. And they've really put us on the map internationally. I mean, the DEA, the Americans, they're on wanted posters. There's five million bounties on their heads for information. And they have really placed us as international players in the drug scene globally. And they've diversified into all different types of things, green energy. I mean, it's in the- To legitimize the money. I mean, they're air, actually- Air they ambulances? Yeah, they don't really care too much about the sort of legitimate companies. They use them to launder, to wash that dirty money into the clean economy. And that's the- you know, when you're that high up in the drug business, that's what you need to do. It's a kind of a, you know, you're doing the dirty work, but you're also trying to clean it so you can spend it and you can enjoy it. So when the Americans starting to sort of tighten uh, mm. things on the Kinnahans, um, who's filling that gap here in Ireland? Well, I mean, there's always people to fill the gaps, always, unfortunately, the, you know, when you topple a big king, there is kind of this flux that goes on. And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of that, a kind of young gangs are really trying to grab turf. They're trying to seize uh, positions within the, the sort of the, the underworld. We've seen a lot of horrific murders and feuds that have happened in the last couple of years. As this huge process of dismantling the Kinahan organization is still underway, bear in mind the three 
you know, leaders of it, Christy Kinahan and his two sons, Daniel and Christopher Jr., are still free. They're probably enjoying a dinner tonight, actually, in Dubai, in a hotel. They're still there. Um, they're not untouchable. Their time is coming to its end. You think it is? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's currently files with our Director of Public Prosecutions, and if they come back in the new year, we'll be in a completely different position with the United Arab Emirates. If they come back with charges for those three, um, I believe the Emirates are going to have to probably hand them over at that point. So if you're saying that they're starting to get into diffs, but the usage is still going up, mm. I'm imagining supply is based on demand. Yes. So demand is still sky high. Absolutely. It's a little bit of a disconnect, isn't it, really? Because we don't really like these guys getting that powerful and becoming that dangerous. And we don't like people getting shot dead on our streets. We don't like communities being destroyed by drugs. And yet we take them. And cocaine in particular is, has this ability. It just, there's, there's no classes. Everybody takes it. And while the dealers do well during the week, they get this massive economic boost at the weekends when the middle class people who have jobs go out and they want to take coke at night and they do not see their hundred euro going up the chain into the pocket of Daniel Kinahan who sends or, or maybe they do down. and don't care maybe they do and don't care so you know it's sort of to me it's a little bit like it's a little bit like climate change. We're sort of doing these stupid things constantly, knowing the results and knowing the consequences of them, but we still do them because we feel, sure, it's just me. I mean, what difference am I going to make? Um, so, so you've done the podcast, you've done the articles, you do live shows. Mm. Um, do these guys... Bizarre, really, isn't it? No, I mean, it just shows <laughs> the interest in the interest. Yeah. So, I never thought I'd be doing a live show about organized crime it is really strange it is so strange you know but there's all, a huge appetite there for is it. absolutely and like to me as well if i have anything i can give it's a little bit of sort of trying to put it all together and explaining it and you know what this does causes this i don't know whether that makes any difference it probably doesn't but you can but try do these guys read your articles? Do they listen to the podcasts? Do some of these gang members, do they come to the shows? Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of people that listen, that read, that, you know, come to the shows. You know, funny, there's all sorts of personalities in the underworld, if we'll call it. The same personalities you meet in your everyday life. Some people want the publicity, they crave it. Some of the criminals want the headlines. They want to be the ones you're talking about. Others don't. So if you're writing those headlines, and do they contact you and say, we like that one, we didn't like that sometimes. one, you got that wrong, really? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> or they might complain about a photograph. They might just really dislike that particular photograph and they might prefer if you used a different one. I mean, They're we've, quite we've, normal. We've, we've all like been there. all of us. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's quite weird. Isn't it, it is quite weird, yeah. Um, and when you chat to these guys, I mean, is it friendly? Is it? Again, there's all sorts of different personalities in it. You can have a lot of people can be quite charming, you know, and in a different world, they'd be people you'd quite enjoy having a drink with. Um, some are really nasty. And obviously, the violence in that world and the terror um, that comes down the lines to really families in communities and to the grooming of children and all that goes on with that. Um, they're actually calling it radicalizing children now in Europe, which I think is a really good word for it because that's what it is. I mean, they're really immoral people that exist in that world. There are some good people who've been drawn in for different reasons, but again, it's just like, it's like the ordinary world. It just exists beside us in the shadows. It's interesting just sitting talking to you here and you're talking about other people and how it's dangerous for other people and you seem really relaxed. I mean, I would imagine writing about it. Is that not dangerous? Um, I suppose there's times that it can be and there's times that there's threats. Like all journalists, crime journalists get threats. Like you don't get like 
big boxes of makeup at Christmas. You get a solicitor's letter or something like that, or you get a threat from somebody. But you kind of get used to it, and um, it's not all the time. And most of the stuff is okay, and mostly it's okay. Um, I think, in a way, they sort of, you know, see it as most of the criminals see it as you're just doing a job. And once you don't make it too personal, um, in my experience anyway, it's to try not make it personal, just to try and make it speak in general about things, you know, um, and I suppose try and avoid the ones that want to stay in the shadows and don't want you poking too hard. So let's bring it back to the start again. So, you know, there's plenty coming in. There's not enough being seized. Uh, you can get it everywhere. This looks like it's only going one way. Where's Ireland going to be, do you think, in 10 years' time? Like, Ireland really has an issue with the demand, with the amount of cocaine that we take. And I think that in 10 years' time, in a dream scenario, we'll have pumped a huge amount of money into the community workers to try and, I suppose, bring kids in particular past a particular place where they're, they're drawn into gangs. What can you do about people, adults, educated who take it? You know, what can you do about that? They're making well, what, a decision. What would you do? They're making a decision. You educate them. You try and tell them what that money, where it goes. You try and let them know that... And what if they say, like, I know, but... Uh... But what can you do about that? I think, I suppose, there's many issues, there's many different areas. In particular, for me, I think it's the kids that at 10, 12, 13 are being groomed to be killers. And they're standing, and I see them standing in a courtroom. I see the mothers crying their eyes out, and they are facing a murder charge because they've taken a gun and maybe been promised 10,000 to take someone else's life and they don't understand the consequences of that on their own families and on the generations under them. And I think they're stolen lives. Um, it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, there is so much in this book. Um, congratulations. It's uh, a brilliant read. Nicholas' book, Cocaine Cowboys, is available in bookshops everywhere now. And there is a live event of Cocaine Cowboys, which will tour countrywide next year. All the details on mcd.ie. Nicola Talent, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.